Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley, and we are excited, as always, to be bringing you stories that we think will inspire you. We are part of Rotary International, 1.2 plus million people around the world whose goal is just to make the world a lot better uh, through service to communities near and far. Our own club, the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley, is an online asynchronous Rotary Club based in Northern California, but we have a worldwide membership of very cool people. Uh, and speaking of very cool people, our speaker today is Christina Zanato. She is an ocean conservationist, a diver, a nonprofit person, and someone with lots of amazing stories to tell. I have heard her speak and was jazzed to get her to agree to come and speak to us. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Christina. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Hashin, and thank you, Rotary Club, for having me. Um, as Ashton said, my name is Christine, I'm a professional diver, and my job today is to make you fall in love with sharks and caves in just the 12 minutes allotted by your club. So, so let me start with my picture so we can do that. So what is the difficulty with these two to fall in love with is very simple. One is the perceived the toothy animal that we always hear about every time somebody says sharks that they hear kind of like the jaws and the other one is say caves everybody thinks oh you know we're stuck between a hard rock and a, a, a place excuse me i'm sorry um between a rock and a hard place um so what's the difference the difference is i go down there and i bring up images so this is the first part is the view of my office this is what happens when i enter the water and my group of caribbean reef sharks that sees me and starts swimming towards me most people will think this is frightening this for me is the best time of my day uh, I work in what they call shark tourism. So I actually entertain sharks and I take people dive, dive to see sharks. That was one of my primary jobs. But where people here see a bunch of like gray bodies, I actually see the individuals. Now the names I give them, they're not the most flattering one. As you can see, I have half bait, hook, scrunchy, crook, stumpy, and they are given according to the physical characteristic of each one of them. So that when a person goes in the water with them, they can actually see Stumpy, who is missing a piece of her tail, go, oh yeah, well that has to be Stumpy because a piece of her tail is missing. Uh, one of the things we do is we collect videos of these uh, sharks. They actually live in the same area. And we try to do a video obviously of each side. So each one of them has one side and then the other one and as we do that we basically catalog them away with their uh, name this is grandma and then the other thing i do is i take pictures so it's, this is still grandma so not only i have a video of her but i can also have an identifying part of her eye and obviously a little bit of a blemish of her mouth so again when somebody goes in the water with grandma they can look for specifics and be able to connect with her uh, very easy one of the reasons why I want people to connect with sharks is so that they go beyond, like I said, seeing these toothy, dangerous animals and start seeing actually uh, individuals and with that also personality and characteristics and behavior. So this is another of my girls. Her name is Peggy. If you look at the left pectoral fin, she's missing a little part of her pectoral fin. So from Peg, Peggy is the name that we gave her. What do we do with these sharks besides tourism is a science. We do DNA research. We host quite a lot of students that wanna come in and learn about the sharks. I do put sharks to sleep. So they actually have a chance to do a very non-intrusive uh, capability of researching on their DNA, as well as we do something that is a lot of fun, which is measuring them and tracking their growth record um, through the months. And this is it's done with a little GoPro and the two laser beams, very non-intrusive. Again, we don't have to capture the sharks. We don't have to bring them to the surface. We just have to make sure we capture the entire shark in the entire video, make sure we have th those two laser on the body itself. And that allows us to basically keep track of each and every one of them. And that goes in the folder as well. So we have a folder with the name, characteristics, the measuring, and also their DNA. But the main thing for me is I love sharks. I have loved sharks since I was eight years old. 
And I didn't realize in a certain way how much people actually are afraid of shark, even just of the word shark. Like I said, as soon as they hear that, they kind of like hear the theme jaws. So my mission has been also to try to bring up to the surface what is that we don't realize that we do to sharks. We attack sharks on many levels from an environmental point of view, pollution, overfishing, bycatch, and finning. And the way I do it is I bring my sharks up as ambassadors. So my sharks show up with hooks. They usually have infections. They hurt. So I go ahead and actually uh, try to remove their hooks. Um, some sharks is very easy as they swim by, I just pull the hook out of their side of their mouth or their pectoral fin. Sometimes like in this case, I'm a little bit more intrusive and kind of like dive deep into the shark's mouth in order to remove the hooks. And what I didn't realize is by removing the hooks, I created an attention towards sharks that people didn't have before including people going, oh, I didn't know that actually sharks could hurt. I actually, they had this belief that sharks will not feel any pain. And so showing a hook removal is not to ask people to go there and remove hooks, but it's to make people think, hey, these are animals. These are actually creatures that feel fear and are hurt, and our presence is actually affecting them. So. To date, I have over 300 hooks that I keep in a special box that was gifted to me in China when I went to speak about uh, shark feeding. They invited me to help them fight this uh, cruel practice. And thanks to a lot of the work, shark tourism, and that the uh, basically highlighting of sharks are better alive than dead. That in 5th July 2011, the Bahamas declared our 243,000 square miles of archipelago, a shark sanctuary. So there's no fishing, no herding, no lending, no killing on sharks all over the Bahamas. And that's very much uh, something that I'm very proud of because it started off with a small petition that I created that collected about 25,000 signatures. I also bring people down there to uh, educate them and they want to experience that, hopefully, um, they'll go back to their country and speak those languages that I can't speak and share their experience and share the fleet of sharks and basically become future oceans ambassadors. Do quite a lot of local outreach program from talking to the schools to beach cleanup to local training from open water all the way to dive master and instructor, host, aerolic scholars. So, so quite a lot of educational, kind of like all well around. Um, COVID was very much beneficial. I did over 250 presentations, classroom sessions, podcasts, anything of that kind in the last basically year. So quite a lot of outreach programs. I reached a lot of countries that I never thought I'd be able to do uh, in the past. So that was really good. And then this belongs to the good old days when I was actually able to travel abroad. So how do sharks relate with caves? Well, thanks to this little fella that I was swimming on my ankles, I was getting ready to go cave diving. Now in the Bahamas, we have two types of caves. We have land caves with this beautiful kind of like fantastic looks so similar to the cenotes in Mexico. And we have ocean blue holes. There are obviously caves that have developed when the islands were drier and now they are in the ocean. So what do these ocean blue holes have is they're connected to mangroves. So now I have a cave, an ocean blue holes, and mangroves, and an ocean nearby. So they're all one after the other. And the sharks are swimming there. So there's two things about these caves that are very important. One is this guy is not floating in air. He's floating in a super clear, fresh drinking water. So our caves are freshwater reservoirs. Very, very important nowadays. I'm pretty sure you from California understand that even better than us in the Bahamas. And uh, there is a demarcation between the fresh water lens, which is where you see the white decorations and the salt water lens where you see the decoration becoming darker. Yes, as you swim through the cave, there's a stark demarcation between the two media. Obviously they don't mix. So one, we have fresh water. Uh, in order to understand what these caves do, what do we do? We have to map them. So the little tool that I have in my hands is called NEMO and allows me to actually survey the caves that we explore so that we can actually find out where the land holes, like in this case of Chimney, 
and the blue holes of Mermaid Pond travel and connect. So we have land holes, we have ocean holes, and some of them through our survey, we verify that they actually connect. What does it mean? Well, very simple. When the water, when the holes connect, the water travels. And when the water travels through tidal changes, it actually creates what we call siphons, like in this cave, and it goes inside this uh, blue hole here. And then what it does, it also drags in basically plastic, but also non-visible particles, for example, pollution. When the water travels the other way, then it goes from the land that has been developed and polluted and brings it out in the ocean, back to the mangroves, back to the sharks, back to the corals where everything is basically uh, concentrated. So you see how we start connecting now. We have the land holes polluted, travels through the ocean or the ocean into the land holes and everything is connected uh, through mangroves. This is a another video of another cave called Cemetery Hole. And basically we lay the line in it and through the flow within an hour of our dive, we were down there for two hours, a plastic will just siphoned in. And then we found plastic all the way in um, as we're basically we're diving. So what does it mean? So this is a healthy case. Uh, the orange that you see, a microbial growth, so that is healthy and clear. And this is a cave with uh, too much nutrients in it. So that microbial growth actually kind of like exploded, so creates an unbalance. And all of this travels the same way I travel through this cave, it travels. So what do we do? We try to bring up to the surface the caves, how you make people fall in love with wet rocks while showing how pretty these wet rocks are showing how important they are. And we do that through what we call interactive maps. So not only we map the caves, but we actually take videos that then people can follow and actually see how beautiful it is down there. They can actually do something even more special. They can actually do, click on the map and decide, I wanna see where I am in this big yellow circle here travels with you along the map and tells you, you are right here. And so I can actually show you where you are from Google Earth, down on the map, down on the planet, down on the water, from the safety of your tablet. So that is what an interactive map is. I can actually bring you cave diving with me, even if you're not a cave diver. And all of this is, again, to create connection. And then obviously we do quite a lot of uh, research involved with uh, flow meters. Right now we're on hold. We have new permits that have come out. And this is how I hope I make you fall in love between caves and sharks. Um, final project is basically to identify all these areas and basically tell the government, hey, look, these are the yellow stars, caves that are already being explored on the map. Maps are available. The red ones is there's cave entrances, but we're unable not to fit through. So there's Fortunately, no map, but be aware there's water traveling here too. And the purple ones is, I wonder what's there. And we actually have, still have to explore those. This is the basically quote by which I go. It's by Baba Dion, 1968. It says, in the end, we'll conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. We'll understand only what we are taught. And that is my mission, exploration, education, and conservation. We explore, we educate, and then we're able to protect. Christina, fantastic. Thank you very much for the presentation. I am excited for us to get into the Q&A. Before we do, I'd like to introduce the people we have on our recording today. My name is Rushton. I am part of the, the founding team of the E-Club of Silicon Valley, and uh, I am joined by Two more of our members, uh, Cecilia Babkirk, who is in uh, Sunnyvale, and Shags Paella Master Chagrin up in Walnut Creek. Also in the Bay Area is, is our guest, Raj Bandari. Thank you very much for joining us, Raj. And from, uh, from our, our, our buddy club, Rotary E Club of Hawaii, Susan and Melissa, thank you two for joining us as well. Christina, in order to get uh, in order to get us started on these questions, I'd, I'd like to jump in with the first one, and, and that is. Tell us about your nonprofit. You've got this business that's had people 
getting to know sharks and diving. Uh, and at some point, you were uh, you were inspired to start a nonprofit. Tell us about its mission and what you what you're doing with it. The nonprofit is a uh, people of the water. Um, and it was created to allow me to widen and expand the uh, three core words that actually are part of what is my work and my passion, which is exploration, education, and conservation. And they stand on the, you need to explore uh, not only what you don't know, but also what you know sometimes. You need to question that. So for me, it's very important that we all explore as our heart. And it could be an exploration of, like I do, caves, or a behavior of sharks, but it could be anything else that we as humans see and says, I wonder how that works. And then once we explore, we have education. The first part is educating ourselves. Oh, I didn't know that. And it's like, well, there's a lot of things sometimes we forget. We don't know what we don't know. So it's very important to always question ourselves and our basic belief and says, well, I didn't know that. And so once you educate yourself, then you can educate others. My firm belief is also that you educate others in a, in a good old saying that says you capture more flies with honey than with vinegar. So my education is about always the thinking, they don't know what they don't know. So I'm very much into not attacking someone for what they do, but trying to say, hey, did you know that? And try to explain that. And once you actually open the eyes, I've realized that is when you can push conservation. When people finally, instead of looking at a gray toothy body, they actually look at grandma with a personality, with a feel, with a need, with a hurt, they go, well, I want to protect the other grandmas of the ocean. And so then they go, well, I want to protect. So that it was a nonprofit was born for, to allow me to spend more hours doing these outreach programs, talk to, I've reached places I never thought I would be able to reach, like Georgia in a former USSR. I just did a TEDx in India. I've spoken to people in Singapore and China, I, in, in this, Australia. I mean, we, we do this at time uh, schedules, but it's amazing because that is uh, very much part of the progress because then the people that I can reach can speak in their language, the ones I don't speak. I speak five, but I don't speak the rest of them. And in their language, they can actually reach their people through their cultural method, their, their way of approaching someone. Because maybe as a Western, I may be sometimes perceived as rude or abrasive, even if I'm not, it's just because of my mannerism work with American people or with Italian people, they might not work, let's say, for example, in China or in India. So why not let a Chinese person do the talk for me through their experience? And then a lot of it, the, the, the nonprofit is helping me through the physical work. A lot of the things we do are extremely expensive. Uh, the survey, the gear that we take in a cave. When you see Kid at me up in that video, I'm slapping around easily over $20,000 worth of gear that I purchased personally through the years or through you know, help from sponsors and stuff like that. But maintaining all of that and doing all the work the caves destroy. So that's where the nonprofit helps. All right. Well, we've got three questions lined up. I'm going to start with one that Raj added to the chat. Uh, can you talk about the eyes of the sharks? Or are they sharp? Tell us about the eyes. Oh, so, wow, what a good question. So I am not an expert, but I was talking with Dr. Miki McCombs-Kobza, and she is a shark eye expert. Uh, shark vision is actually really, really good, but it also depends on the species. So some shark species, have been known actually to have developed cone cells. So you can actually see colors, basic colors. Some sharks, for example, the pelagic sharks, the sharks that live in the open ocean, like let's say a make or a blue shark, most likely only capable to see more in the shades of blue. And they have more rod cells because they only need to see like shadows and movement and shapes. Uh, contrary to popular belief, they have very good vision. What people sometimes forget is that you can have 2020, but if you're in a fog, uh, your 2020 is not going to help. So there's a huge difference between bad vision and bad visibility. That's just why you hear a lot about people saying, well, don't go swimming with murky water. It's not that the shark has bad vision, it's just bad visibility. So it has to come much closer in order to identify. And they also have night vision. So in the back of their eye, they have a coating as a mirror shape, like it's not called uh, tapetum, tapetum lucidum. I do apologize for my thing. I have a thing with lightning. <laughs> um, 
tapetum lucidum, and is basically a shining carpet that reflects their light and gives them night vision. Now, vision is also determined by the eye's position. So if you look at a hammerhead that has a giant hammer and the eyes are here, they have a very good, kind of like they say, over 180 vision, but they also have a very long blind spot in front of their nose before the eye vision basically connects. So the pointer of the nose, the less the cone of blindness, the wider the space between the eyes, the wider basically the cone of uh, blindness. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And I know, Melissa, you have a question. So if you'll unmute and uh, chime in, that would be great. I was just curious how how you started on this journey. Was it an interest of yours from a child from childhood or did you develop it later? It was a childhood dream of following a movie uh, that I watched, which I'm pretty sure it was like very um, B-roll movie type of thing, but it was a guy that could actually swim with sharks. This is 1978. I was about seven years old and we're on the tail end of Jaws. And the movie is about a guy that with a special medallion can actually have sharks for friends. And I came up in a family of the ocean. My father, my mom were always bringing me to, be, to the water and always explain that animals are just that. They are animals and we just need to understand them. There's no monsters in the sea, they said. It's only the one you make up in your head. But the fascination was that this guy could actually have sharks for friends. And so I decided that one day I will be an underwater scuba ranger would actually have sharks for friends. And my duty would be to go around the ocean, tell people, no, you can't do that. Not you need to do that. But the bonus was that my mom could not actually tell me to come out of the water, although my lips were purple and I was shivering from head to toe. <laughs> The, it took a big gap between, between the seven and the 22 years old to be able to start the path, but I, I never thought I would be able to realize my childhood dream. I went a totally different study path, to be honest with you. Fantastic. Um, next question is also from, from one of our Hawaiians or, or based in Hawaii, and that's from Susan, who is also the Rotarian working to start the fellowship for, for those who love animals. So. Uh, Susan, how appropriate to have you. Please ask your question. Well, I'm originally from Toronto, so no ocean experience. So I've been living in Hawaii for 24 years and a little bit nervous about sharks. So when you're in the water, how can you tell the difference between its grandma coming up to check you out or something like a shark that might be a little scarier? So what's the best practice if you're in the water and see something? It's a very good question. So one will be from experience. So being able to recognize a shark species, then that usually comes from exposure. I mean, you can look at pictures and, and videos, but you know, as the, you, you know very well, the haze of the water, maybe you're on the surface, the sun is shining behind you, you look down and the sharks are designed to counter shading to their environment. So you look down and they're dark plastered against the dark bottom. You look up and they're white plastered against the brightness of the sun. So unless you're someone that spends a lot of time in the water with them, it might be a little bit difficult to say, well, that's a Caribbean reef shark, so that's a tiger. Although to me, for example, they would be very easy. If you are uncomfortable, depend, and again, depends on many things. That's what I tell people. It depends on a shark species. It depends on where you are. So are you on the surface? Are you in midwater? Are you on the bottom? What you're doing? Are you surfing, paddle boarding, snorkeling, spear fishing, scuba diving? Because each one sends off a different message. And it's obviously a different message from different species. A lot of people say, well, if you're on the surface, you automatically food. I'm like, no, if I'm swimming on the surface on top of a bunch of nurse sharks, chances are they either going to ignore me or actually run away because it scares them because I look like a massive predator. If I swim on a surface on top of this tiger shark, I instead may attract the interest and say, ha, huh, I wonder if that's a prey because the tiger shark is a predatory kind as a surface hunter and they go after turtles. So there's not a one size fit all kind of answer. Mostly is experience. If you are uncomfortable is slowly and calmly uh, move away from the area and just observe the animal. Chances are most of the encounters, the sharks will just basically cruise through and ignore you. But it's very easy if the sharks starts showing an interest, what you don't want to do is actually, you know, 
uh, get upset, splash, and turn your back to it. Just you know, face the animal and just tell them, hey, look, I have nothing to do with your food, and they'll be able to recognize that. All right, let's get another question. Uh, this one from Cecilia. I think it was pretty cool that all those sharks that you were swimming with clearly knew who you were. How long did it take to for them, you and them, to become so familiar with each other? Well, sharks in general are very easy to be in the water with. If people really could understand how easy it is to jump in, 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 a, in a pool of sharks and of whatever species. Here at Tiger Beach, we can dive with five different species species all at once, tigers, bulls, lemons, Caribbean, nurse sharks, and they're very tall and of our presence in the ocean. The connection that I have to the point of where a shark comes into my lap is established to the same way that you would establish a relationship. So I tell people, you know, you're not in a relationship on your first date. Yeah. Uh, chances are you're not going to say you're in a relationship after 10 dates. So it's the same thing with sharks. It's a through time, knowledge, understanding, and sometimes a little bit of patience for me it's very important and also um appreciation that they might have some days where they want to be approached more and some days where they don't want to be approached more so it's more on their terms in mind but it's uh, through time primarily these are relationship and were those nurse sharks caribbean reef sharks oh okay i mean they look kind of like nurse sharks but i'm not an expert at all about that topic <laughs> And we have whites here, white sharks. Yes. And, um, and I think in Hawaii as well, because don't you have shark nets up there uh, near the most popular, maybe that's Australia. Yeah, Australia we, uh, has great whites. Hawaii is more known for tigers. They've had yeah. few uh, bad accidents with tigers in Hawaii. And how Australia, unfortunately, with great whites, yes. Uh, but in that you so we can also look at those numbers, right? So if you think about in the United States, there's about 75 million people that go in the water per year, uh, whatever they do, uh, watercraft, this water ski and all that. And in the last 40 years, the United States has recorded about 26 shark attacks total. Mm -hmm. Right, so the, just to think about the numbers. So, so the problem with the shark attacks, I think, is that there is a, so much emphasis on it. And that's all we hear. We never hear about the millions of people that daily go on the water in the same areas, in the same locations, and nothing ha happens over and over again. Right. And it will be interesting to have a balance between if a shark attack happened, it's like, well, why don't we let also the other people that were in the water in the 24 hours six months, a year, 10 years, maybe sometimes 20 years before an attack happens and let them talk the same amount of time of the person has been attacked and see how many hours we're going to listen to people that said, yeah, I was in the water, nothing happened. And how many minutes are we going to listen to someone who has been attacked? And I'm not undermining the attacks. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's scary. I, I, I don't think there's anyone that like to actually you know encounter that kind of fate but the numbers are so minuscule mm. i know that's true at least here in california and there are places where <clears throat> up north of san francisco where they actually breed um but i mean i've been here a long time and i don't remember more than one or two hearing you know just very few attacks but i was just curious Excellent. Thanks, Cecilia. Uh, for our last question, Raj, I know you have one. Yeah, I understand it. So um, sometimes with <clears throat> land animals, it's easy to relate to them because you can kind of look at them and see, see something in their eyes, right? So you, there's a connection with, with animal life that way. With the sharks, can, can you see something in their eyes? Do they emote through their eyes? That is a very good question. Unfortunately, in a way, they don't they watch you like as they swim by they acknowledge you right so if i'm standing a shark swims by she'll be like looking like this but they don't have the emotional expressions they also and that is a hard part for people to fall in love with fish in general right if i talk to my dog it'll go and move ahead it'll lift the ear and they have like more of a facial facial expressions and body movements that sharks don't and so that is where the connection becomes harder but yeah no they don't have that emotional eye connection mm -hmm. so 
Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, I, I think uh, that we'll probably have plenty of more questions once we, once we stop the recording. But uh, for all of you who are watching this as a recording, we thank you for joining us this week uh, for our, our, our club's meeting, which you can always join. And I mean always, 24-7, uh, our, our weekly program is up and ready to go. And by letting us know you were here through the attendance form that is just below where you are finding this recording on our, our webpage, uh, you'll be able to let us know, hey, I was here, which if you type your email address in properly, will generate an email you can pass along to your club secretary to make a missed meeting at your own club. And finally, in our forum at the bottom, we hope you'll leave some comments. You know, what, what, is, what is your experience with, with cool, affectionate sharks? <laughs> and, and, and respond to any piece of our, our meeting that, that struck you as interesting in some fashion. That's one of the ways that, that our club members strewn all across the world share ideas and uh, and, and interact. And so we hope you will do that as well. As we always like to do, we hand it back to our speaker for the final thought. So Christina, if you would, uh, what, what, is, what is that you would like everybody to walk away with? I would like to walk away, I would like everybody to walk away with the understanding of what I call the power of one. So in this quick presentation, I showed what I've been able, and lately in the last three years, I've been joined by one other person, but like what I've been able to do as one person and to understand that we can actually as an individual really influence change and we can actually influence into positivity and that we have to do that and not sit there and think well that's a problem i wonder how somebody's going to solve that it's like no that's a problem this is my first step to try to solve that i call it the star thrower story <clears throat> fantastic all right everyone we'll see you next week her. Way to go. Way to go, Shags. <laughs>